Habemus Papam. Eminentissimum ac reverendissimum Dominum. Dominum Iosefum. Sancte Romane Ecclesiae Cardinalem Ratzinger. Joseph Ratzinger was born on Holy Saturday of 1927 in Bavaria. The youngest of three children, Joseph and his brother Georg, were ordained to the priesthood on the same day in 1951. At the age of just 32, Joseph was made a professor of theology at Bonn University. In the early 1960s, he participated in the Vatican Council serving as a theological consultant to the German Cardinal Josef Frings. At this time, Ratzinger was thought of as one of the most liberal minds at the Council and cooperated with Hans Kuhn in trying to reform the Church. But in the late 1960s, Ratzinger's views seemed to shift closer to the more traditional voices in the Church. And it was around this time that he became good friends with the newly elected Pope John Paul II. He was created a cardinal in 1977. Towards the end of the century, Cardinal Ratzinger wished to retire from the public life and submitted his resignation as Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith three times to the Pope. Three times his request was rejected, and in 2005, Pope John Paul II died. As Dean of the College of Cardinals, Ratzinger presided over the funeral of the Pope. During the ceremony, members of the crowd shouted, Santo Subito, Saint Now. And sure enough, just 20 days after Benedict was elected as Pope, he initiated the beatification process for his predecessor. Pope Benedict's first foreign trip as pontiff was to his home country for the World Youth Day of 2005. This was attended by more than a million young people amid concern that they would perceive the Pope to be too private and intellectual. But throughout the three World Youth Days the Pope attended, he proved to be popular with the younger generation and very willing to engage in dialogue. Whilst in Germany for the event, Pope Benedict visited a synagogue and met with various Jewish leaders. He spoke out against the insane, racist ideology of Nazism, calling the Second World War the darkest period of German history. This was to be one of many speeches by the Pope, highlighting the evils of the Nazi occupation, including visits to Israel and to the Auschwitz concentration camp. Despite this, the media never lost interest in his membership of the Hitler Youth as a young teenager. Ratzinger's family was harassed during the war as his father was adamantly anti-Nazi. A young cousin of the future Pope, suffering with Down syndrome, was murdered under the eugenic scheme of the Nazis. It's no surprise, therefore, that Joseph refused to attend meetings of the Hitler Youth despite his obligatory membership. 
Benedict was a strong promoter of Christian unity, whilst refusing to compromise on Catholic doctrines. One such example was the Ordinariat, make it easier for groups of Anglicans to join the Roman Catholic Church, while still preserving elements of their spiritual and liturgical heritage. Within just three years, thousands of Anglicans all over the world had become Catholic. At the other end of the spectrum, the Pope enjoyed less success. Negotiations with the ultra-traditional Society of Pius X didn't come to fruition, and they remain outside the Church. This was a cause of great sadness for the Pope. However, much of his legacy lies in his writings about the liturgy. In his apostolic letter, Samorum Pontificum, he ensured that it would become far more acceptable for priests to celebrate the extraordinary form of the Mass, and he encouraged the reintroduction of solemn liturgical traditions. At the same time, Benedict tried to push the faith forward into the 21st century by encouraging Catholics to use social media and other resources to propagate their beliefs. This was part of the new evangelization of which he often spoke and his personal use of Twitter led the way. Everything Benedict did pointed to Christ, something reflected in his three-part series of books on the life of Jesus. And it was from this deep relationship with Jesus that he said he found the strength to make one of the most momentous decisions of his papacy. On February the 11th, 2013, Benedict gave a speech that would truly make history. We were there for a normal consistory meeting. And when we concluded that, we were about to get the blessing. And he said, please sit down. I have something to say <laughs> important for the church. So it was for us a surprise, like thunder that gives no notice that it's coming. As he moved on, from what he was saying as the, the introduction, I began to fear that that's what he would come to. The cardinals, each one looked at the other in silence, in surprise, but it was clear what he said. The speech, given in Latin and with no previous leaks even hinting that he might resign, left the Catholic world in shock. But at the Pope's last Angelus, delivered from his study high up in the Vatican, he clarified his intentions. I signore, I signore mi chiama, grazie. I signore, I signore mi chiama a salire sul monte a dedicarmi ancora di più alla preghiera e alla meditazione. Ma questo non significa abbandonare la Chiesa. Anzi, se Dio mi chiede questo, è proprio perché io possa continuare a servirla con la stessa dedizione e lo stesso amore con cui ho cercato di farlo fino ad ora, ma in un modo più adatto alla mia età e alle mie forze. Io chiamo... On the 28th of February, his final day as Pope, Benedict gave a public farewell at his last audience to the hundreds of thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Then, he was flown off to Castel Gandolfo to be, as he himself put it, simply a pilgrim about to start his last journey on Earth. It happened yesterday. The death of Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI. He was the first German Pope in a thousand years. In many ways, a guardian of Vatican traditions, he was a respected Catholic theologian, a professor, and he played the piano.
By his own admission, a weak leader who struggled with the formidable Vatican bureaucracy. Seth Doan is in Rome. A scholar, academic, and fierce defender of the faith, he was conservative to the core. But this most orthodox of popes did the most unorthodox thing when he became the first pontiff in 600 years to resign. Burying a retired pope is also unprecedented in modern times. Saturday evening, the current pope, Francis, paid tribute, calling Benedict XVI a noble, kind man who was a gift to the world. When Benedict retired in 2013, he acknowledged in Latin that the strains of duty had become too much. He was stepping down as the church was rattled by sex abuse and corruption scandals. You think of Pope Benedict as such a conservative, but in resigning, it was a, it was a revolutionary thing. It was a pretty progressive thing to do. In some ways, he was very much in line with this idea of modernizing the church. I think it reflects his attention to the fact that we're in a contemporary age. You know, in, before the modern age, popes didn't live so long. Oh, Father Mark still... Lewis is an American Jesuit priest and rector of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. I think one of the things that's fascinating is he's one of the few popes who wrote books during his papacy. So he did three volumes in Jesus Christ and what's really interesting about those books is he didn't write them as Pope Benedict. He wrote them as, as Joseph Ratzinger. Born in 1927, Joseph Ratzinger was the son of a policeman and a cook, growing up in a small Bavarian town in Germany. He joined the Hitler Youth, as was compulsory, and later was conscripted into the German army. He'd wind up deserting and turned to religion, rising through the ranks of the church. As cardinal, he ran the organization charged with defending church doctrine and developed a reputation as a strict conservative. Maintaining those hardline views as pope, he strongly opposed gay marriage and the ordination of women. And in 2009, he caused an uproar by dismissing condoms as a way to prevent AIDS. While Benedict was also criticized for not taking action against bishops who ignored or covered up clerical sex abuse, he was the first pope to publicly meet victims of abuse, and he apologized. As pope, he was credited with reaching out to other faiths, including Judaism. He was a linguist, a bookworm, and a pianist who loved Mozart's music. News of the former Pope's death came as we were speaking with Father Lewis Saturday morning. I think he was a very gentle man, and I think he tended to, to listen to people and talk very, very much from the heart. That first point, his theology, yeah? Bad news. What? The Pope just died. The Pope just died? Yes. Wow. Wow. What does that mean for you? Well, I think in a way we're sort of fortunate that we had at least a few days of preparation. Um, it also gives us a chance to really reflect on that legacy, on, on, on what he gave to the church and, and that example of resignation and living a, a life of, of isolation in his last years. The last pontiff to resign was Pope Gregory XII. That was 1415 and he moved hundreds of miles from Rome. But Benedict stayed close calling himself Pope Emeritus and living in a monastery set in the sprawling Vatican Gardens. Was it difficult as a church to have two popes, a former pope and a, and a living pope at the same time? I think uh, Benedict was able to make it work because he was so willing to move back out of the limelight. He was very good about not overshadowing Pope Francis. I think Francis saw him as, a, as someone he could consult with. And, maybe the only person in the world who knew what he was going through. Pope Francis will preside over the former Pope's funeral mass Thursday, and from tomorrow, Benedict's body will lie in St. Peter's Basilica so the faithful can pay tribute.
del vostro e se è necessario sia santificato il tuo nome Grazie.